It's official. Shall we? Mm -hmm. oh, I'm not going now. Know. Did something change? Uh oh. Okay. It says it's live. Awesome. All right. Well, oh, welcome. Oh. Here we are. Hello, um, Laura. So nice to see you, Carla. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Yes. So this is part of like almost our weekly series. I feel like we always have so many events going on and, you know, it's so funny. I call them events because at the end of the day, it's trying to get content and information out to people so that they can be educated and empowered and have the information literally at their fingertips when they need it. And what I'm finding is that all of this information pushing out and dissemination has turned into events. So thank you for joining us on this Facebook Live event, quote unquote, as we talk about um, not just health and nutrition, but specifically clean eating. I think there's a lot of confusion, especially around a cancer diagnosis about what am I supposed to be eating? What type of nutrition works for me when I'm going through chemo, after chemo, when I'm on a survivorship plan, when I'm no evidence of disease, et cetera. And, you know, I think just like all of us, we turn to Dr. Google and we try and empower ourselves with as much information as possible about the, the nutrients to put into our bodies and to really thrive as someone living after a cancer diagnosis. Additionally, I want to share with our viewers as well and kind of putting the disclaimers out there. This is a really fun conversation today because it's continuously being a peer-to-peer -peer support opportunity for us to share our experiences and finding what works for us. So everything that we are talking about today um, is, again, peer-to-peer -peer support, and you should always speak with your medical oncologist and your nutritionist about anything in terms of supplements, diets, nutrition that works for you, because you don't know your particular case. All of us are very different and unique with like a diagnosis. I would also like to share with our viewers also, and I think a couple people who listen to our podcast know this as well, but I was a strict vegan before being diagnosed with breast cancer. And so it's become one of these funny pet peeves of mine where people are like, you just need to be a vegan. Like something, like you must have had too much meat or you must have done X, Y, and Z wrong. And, you know, I, I definitely went through the anger phase of how can someone who's a vegan get breast cancer? But what I'm realizing is it prolonged the onset. It gave me years. It added years to my life. I already had a very healthy lifestyle. And that was very helpful as I went through very difficult treatment. So I just like to share that also with the information that we're sharing today. 
you know, these are all like best practices, if you will. So for those of you joining us tonight, I'm so excited to have you. And in particular, I am thrilled to have Carla on the podcast today and the Facebook Live, who is, you know, I think we got connected through actually a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you are a breast cancer thriver living with metastatic breast cancer and just have opened my eyes up, open to like the the holistic natural ways of utilizing medicine in complements to our traditional care. And so I think that's really important how we can start making small incremental changes in lifestyle and behavior and utilizing food really literally as medicine is going to help us live our best life possible by a breast cancer diagnosis. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. And, and you're right. It is those small incremental changes over time that really help us to improve our our outlook, our chances, et cetera. So I am thrilled to be here to share this information that I've learned over my journey. Yes. And you're not new to surviving breast cancer network. We actually got to partner on a retreat that you are hosting in um, partnership with Radical Remission and offering a two week virtual retreat for some of our members, myself included, mm -hmm. which is unbelievable. And so that, again, I'm so grateful for and learned so much from that experience that I hope we can talk a little bit about that tonight too. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. I would love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. I think a lot of times when we're diagnosed with breast cancer and we're trying to figure out what works, what works for me, et cetera, it's nice to identify with somebody who's been there, done it, gone through it, et cetera. So, you know, I think just understanding where we're both coming from is really helpful to our listeners and our viewers. Um, so just real quickly, I'll share that I am um, a breast cancer survivor and there was lymph node involvement and there's all sorts of like drama I'm not going to get into. But for the purpose of this conversation, it is important to know that I am um, ER positive, so estrogen receptor positive. And Carla, before the show, you and I were talking a little bit about what does this mean and you know, what you should be aware of because this time... I do not want to give my body anything that has to do with estrogen in fear of a recurrence. So we're going to definitely jump into that. What I love about uh, tonight's conversation, you're not only going to give us an overview of nutrition, but also like tactical takeaways and things to avoid and things to implement and really how we can live a uh, better life. So I just wanted to share also that from an ER perspective, ER positive perspective, that is why I'm so excited to have you on the show tonight. But please your breast cancer. Right. Sorry, the phone is I had the clock here in front of me. Now it's going off. So yeah. Thanks. And I'm ERPR positive. So yeah, I hope to be able to give everyone tonight some some practical things, um, you know, tips that they can take away and actually really help them um, to move forward with, you know, eating better day by day to really live that optimal health. So are you ready for me to go ahead and jump in? Yes. yes. Great. So I'll introduce myself first before I put the slides up. So I'm Carla Mans Giroux. I am a breast cancer thriver, a longevity geek, and a holistic cancer coach. And I was originally diagnosed with breast cancer in 2003. I was just 37 years old. I had a five-year-old and a two-year-old. So it was pretty scary, pretty devastating. Um, looking back on it now so long ago, it was like, well, nine months kind of over and done and you know, move forward on life again. I was really just interested in getting back to taking care of my sons and getting back to my career. And, you know, there wasn't the internet and I didn't know a lot about holistic healing and alternative and complementary methods. And so I went the um, conventional route. I had uh, chemotherapy, a mastectomy, radiation, and five years of tamoxifen. And every year that I hit my anniversary, I kept thinking, okay, good, I'm, I'm, I'm done, this is good. And I got to 10 years and I thought, great, 10 year cancer anniversary. Yes, but at 11 years, I got a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis. So it returned, it returned to bone. Um, I found it actually relatively early. Uh, uh, something weird was going on in my leg and um, my knee just kept giving out on me and I, 
I didn't fall down a lot, but I fell down a couple of times. I wasn't able to do lunges anymore. I was like, this is weird. So I started looking at chiropractor and a pinched nerve and then on to an orthopedic and an x-ray of the knee and then finally to a neurologist and an MRI. And when they did the MRI of the body, they found that the cancer had grown in such a way that it was blocking a nerve pathway. So it was growing in the bone opening enough to block that opening and pinch that nerve. And so immediately back to my um, oncologist to find out what to do. And I really give him a lot of credit for giving me hope because he told me right away, this is a chronic disease we can manage. I said, great, I'm gonna manage the hell out of this because I <laughs> plan to live to be 100, healthy and sane, and I'm not gonna let this get in my way. And so he was all on board with me, he just said he wasn't gonna be able to make the birthday party in 2065, which, okay, fine, you get a pass on that. So I really did jump into managing it full on with everything that I could. Every, you know, I hired a cancer coach. I changed my diet. I really did a lot of lifestyle and, you know, cleaning up the toxins and all that kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> that was in 2014 when I got that diagnosis. In about 2016, I did have a liver tumor show up. But within six months, it was fully resolved. And wow. since then, 2016, I have seen no evidence of disease, um, no more cancer. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. So it's been four plus years where I can't really say the bone scan is no evidence of disease. Because you know the bone scan, it's scarred. It's never going to look clean again. And so all they'll tell me is it's stable. But when it comes to my um, um, CT scans, no evidence of disease. So that's my story. I've been thriving um, all along and really pleased to have that four plus years of no evidence in my pocket. And I'm going to keep it that way. So, yeah. Were you so I'm about cancer when, um, like, 10 years is such a milestone, right? So right. when this happened at year 11, did this even cross your mind that it could have been metastasis? You know, it really didn't. Um, in the beginning, it didn't. I noticed first my shin was numb. I would shave my legs. And I thought, Why is my shin numb? That's weird. And then the knee thing with the doing lunges when I exercise and stuff. But no, it never crossed my mind. I got that MRI results and they're like, um, like, I think I had it on a Thursday and they were supposed to call me on Monday. And they called me on a Friday afternoon. I'm like, well, with your history, we see some unusual activity and we called your primary care physician. It's like, okay, immediate freak out. Like now I'm thinking the worst and, you know, the primary care physician can't do a whole lot for me and it's a Friday afternoon. So I got to spend the weekend fretting over it. Why do they call it on Friday? I know. They, wouldn't they just wait until Monday? I had no real worry about it until they called to say yeah, that. Like, what can you do over the weekend except, like, be, like, a nutcase? Like, oh. Yep. But there and you are nutcase. and taking such control and management over the situation, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. I'm project manager and, and you know, by, by profession and <laughs> in my background, like, I'm going to manage this. So that's. That's what I've been doing. And I just love sharing what I have learned and what I've implemented and, and how it's really helped me. Excellent. You mentioned also in your introduction about a cancer coach. What is yes. a cancer coach? Yes. So I hired a woman that um, actually my my therapist told me about her because I had said, you know, I'm done therapy. I'm in pretty good shape. It's November. I think I'm going to take the holidays off and whatnot. And then I got diagnosed in late November, early December, and I called her up I'm like, I need you. Oh. And she happened to know this woman who was an RN. Um, she was a or is um, a holistic cancer coach. And she at the time was working at the Cancer Treatment Centers of America in the mind, body, spirit Department of Cancer Treatment Centers. I didn't go there for my treatment, but I contacted her. So a cancer coach is somebody they can help in a number of ways. I'm slightly different because I'm not an RN. I don't have that background that she had. But what I have done is gotten certification from the wisdom of the whole in coaching. I've gone through the radical remission teacher training and coaching certification. So I am prepared and equipped to really 
coach people through this, to be there. You think about coaching, it's somebody that stands just beside and behind you. Mm -hmm. I'm not leaving you, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm helping you on your journey, helping you make the right decisions. And if you ask me what I did, sure, I'll tell you. But what it's more about is you figuring out what you need to do for you. And as you alluded to, from a diet and a supplement perspective, it's so bio-individual that everything really is. It's all very mm -hmm. personal, the choices that you make and the, the journey that you take. Absolutely. And so when did you decide, how did you even start to make some of these lifestyle changes or dietary changes? Maybe giving our listeners and viewers a sense of what was your diet and lifestyle prior to the metastatic diagnosis? Because it sounds like you were pretty healthy regardless because you've already gone through a breast right. cancer diagnosis. Right. I would say I was pretty healthy, but honestly, um, what I learned was that just because I ate vegetables and salads didn't mean I was eating healthy. <laughs> the standard American diet is not a great diet. And um, there's a lot of, even when you don't really think about it, I mean, cereal bar, or granola bar, that's a highly processed food. And that's not necessarily going to do your body any good. There's lot, not a lot of nutrients in that that to outweigh the heavily processed and the, the bad things that are in it. So I was, I was okay from a food perspective. I had actually just before my diagnosis done a, um, a clean eating kind of diet where I eliminated dairy and um, some meat and, you know, kind of reduced meat and um, dairy, dairy completely out, sugar minimized. But what I realized when I got this diagnosis that I had to absolutely change the environment in which that cancer grew because over that past 11 years, it would have been growing. And if I didn't change something drastically, it was going to continue to grow. So for me, it was a, my life depends on it sort of change. And I immediately stopped eating all white sugar. And in fact, um, the fruits that were higher in sugar and even the vegetables, I cut those out too. So there was a time when I wasn't eating bananas or pineapple or carrots, right? Because they just have a higher glycemic in index. Um, but that was, you know, right in the crux of it. I'm like, okay, everything's got to go. And it was really hard because it was like, well, what's left? What do you eat? Yeah. And I remember once shortly after doing all of this, I, you know, leaving the grocery store with my husband and like, kind of in like, I don't, I wasn't really crying, but I was upset. I'm like, I just want the damn cookie. And he's, well, then eat the damn cookie. And I'm like, but I can, you don't understand. It's not okay. Right. Just because I want it, just because I'm whining about it doesn't make it okay. My life depends on me maintaining these lifestyle changes that I've come to know are going to save my life. So I have found cookies that aren't made with all the crap that most cookies are made with, right? And the white sugar and the flour, you know, so there are healthier alternatives. And I have really come to learn a lot about how to find those healthier healthier alternatives and how to make those swaps and, and do things that are sustainable. Take some time. And I will say it was difficult that first, you know, few months, first year, but I'm in a really good place with it now where it's just easy. It's just what I do. Yes, no, that's amazing. And I think you bring up such a good point too, where like, yes, you think you're doing everything right. Or, you know, we're not saying that bananas or carrots or some of these, you know, higher glycemic foods are, are negative or bad for you, right? It's really just in terms of where you are on this health journey and what your body needs in this particular environment. And, um, you know, I know I was sharing with you earlier too, having my own diagnosis of higher potassium and they were like, cut out spinach and banana and, and oranges. I was like, wait, 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 what? Like, have you seen oh, how I make my smoothies in the morning? Like, right. Like I think I'm being healthy and it's really just trying to get that better sense of getting your blood counts done, figuring out how your body is responding and we talk so much about going back to that root cause, right? It's not taking more medicine necessarily to alleviate symptoms, which is also helpful too. But at the same time, it's what's causing this and how can we tweak that and shift that? So okay. I appreciate yep. that. I'm glad I'm not the only one who's told not to eat like carrots or bananas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you do, you know, sometimes you have to weigh the risk benefits, right? And you, and you really do have to think about it 
from a bio individual perspective, like what does buy and body need? So just because Laura can't eat bananas doesn't mean I can't. Exactly. But yeah, it's choices that we have to make. So, all right, you ready for me to get into some content here? Yes, please, absolutely. So you should have the capability of sharing your screen. We can pull uh, up this amazing informational there. resource. I hope I'm sharing the right thing. Can you see the full slide? Yes. Great. All right, so we're gonna get into some clean eating for health. And I'm happy to take questions as we go. Um, already did this introduction, um, but I'm really passionate about this and about staying healthy because again, I intend to live to be 100 healthy and sane. So here's the agenda for tonight. I'm gonna talk about why you wanna eat clean, why you wanna consider plant-based eating. And that doesn't necessarily mean you don't ever eat any meat. It's just 90% plant-based. Then we'll talk about things you can avoid, healthy changes you can make, and healthy things you can add. Um, swaps and subs, I think I pulled that out just because I didn't think we'd have enough time for it, but I, I have a guide that I'll be able to send out that will um, share that information. And then I'll go into those practical tips and tricks that you can apply to your life. And we're even gonna talk a little bit about eating out when you're on a plant-based diet. So let's start with why going plant-based. So I really probably don't need to tell you a lot about chronic inflammation and uh, appearing to underlie most of the chronic disease of today, you know, including cancer. It is something that my integrative doctor looks at every time we do a terrain panel is what's my inflammation level. And a recent study indicated that the non-communicable chronic diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and pulmonary and cardiovascular diseases are becoming the leading cause of death throughout the world. And think about this, in 1950, about 10% of Americans were overweight or obese. That percentage jumped from 10% to 44% in the 60s, and we're all the way up to 72% today. So obesity is a big problem, and it's an, it's a problem when it comes to cancer too. And most of these chronic diseases are preventable because they're linked to lifestyle. So a modified diet, daily exercise, avoiding tobacco, and getting proper sleep can prolong our lives by preventing the occurrence of chronic diseases or improving the management of illnesses that do occur. And among these modifiable determinants of chronic diseases, Nutrition may be the most influential, and there is scientific evidence that increasingly supports the view that alterations in diet have strong effects on health throughout our life. So the diets that are high in fruits, veggies, legumes, fiber, and certain spices have been shown to suppress that chronic inflammation and prevent the development of chronic diseases. And over the past few decades, studies have investigated the possible protective role of plant foods against those chronic diseases. Several of those studies have revealed that greater consumption of fruits and vegetables is associated with a lower risk of chronic disease such as cancer. And then we have these, this evidence-based review of different diets. And there is no one diet that I'm going to say you should be on because it's, again, bio-individual and very personal. And not all of these diets um, are, are going to prove out, you know, to be the best thing for, for everyone. But of these diets listed here, the research is telling us that after looking at these six different types of diets, the low-carb diet, the low-fat vegetarian or vegan diet, the low-glycemic diet, a Mediterranean diet, a mixed balanced diet, and paleo diets, it's clear that the weight of evidence strongly supports a theme of healthy eating while allowing for variations on that theme. And you can see that they noted that they all potentially um, have the common thing that food, not too much, mostly plants. And that is a quote made famous by Michael, Michael Pollan, who is an author um, and uh, has done a lot of research on diets. So the average American spends only 7% of their budget on food. That's less than people spend in any other nation on earth, which 
Maybe that seems like progress, but just look at us. Three quarters of us are overweight and six out of 10 of us suffer from chronic illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, asthma, hepatitis, etc. So does our cheap food have anything to do with that? It might, it probably does. Now, as a radical remission teacher and coach, I would be remiss if I did not mention the work of Dr. Kelly Turner. I am passionate about sharing her work. She researched over 1,500 cases of remissions from cancer. And she's now gone on to start looking at folks that have non-cancer chronic diseases. But she interviewed the survivors, these folks that found a remission after conventional medicine had given up on them and sent them home on hospice, or potentially they, they just went an alternative route to begin with. But she found that all of these radical remission survivors, over 1,500 of them, were utilizing 75 different factors in their healing, but 10 of them were common among all of them. No surprise, one of them is radically changing your diet. And I'll tell you more about what Dr. Turner's research shows. But let's first talk about what we should avoid. And some of this is what Dr. Turner's research indicates. But we should avoid or at least greatly reduce processed foods. I would vote for eliminating processed foods, the highly processed foods, because they contain high amounts of poor quality fat, added sugar and salt, added artificial color and flavor preservatives. They have a low amount of dietary fibers and a negligible amount of beneficial nutrients. They're particularly bad for our health as higher consumption of such foods increase the risk of many diseases and elevates the rate of all-cause mortality. Next up is dairy. Dairy products tend to be a repository of whatever pesticides, industrial chemicals, and other contaminants the cow has ingested. And at the same time, dairy products have none of the fiber you need to control your hormones. And honestly, humans aren't meant to drink cow's milk. Cow's milk is meant to grow babies, calves, to 600 pound cows after all. And if it's calcium you're looking for, there are healthier options. So forget all the marketing claims that you heard that milk does a body good and that you can't live without milk and you need it for, for your calcium. You can get calcium from soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, oat milk, spinach, other veggies, all kinds of places. Where do you think the cow gets their calcium? They don't make it on their own. They're eating grass, which is helping them to produce their calcium. Next up would be meat. Now, I said drastically reduce or eliminate. I've eliminated meat. I do some seafood, but even reducing our meat intake has a protective effect. And research shows that people who eat red meat are at an increased risk of death from heart disease, stroke, or diabetes. And processed meats also increase the risk of death from those diseases. And what you don't eat because you're eating meat can also harm your health. So if your diet is low in nuts and seeds and seafood and fruits and veggies, then you're also increasing your risk of death. One thing I'll mention is that bacon and <laughs> hot dogs, um, while everybody seems to love bacon, it's, it contains high levels of sodium, which lead to high blood pressure and other problems. And that sodium is just the beginning. Part of the reason why bacon is so delicious is it's loaded with saturated fat. Saturated fats linked to heart disease and obesity. Danger also lurks in virtually all store-bought bacon because of the amount of preservatives it contains. And those preservatives, excuse me, preservatives have been linked to various health concerns from headaches to cancer. And according to the World Health Organization, processed meat such as bacon and hot dogs, can be classified as carcinogens. And that's because of those nitrates. Now, if you're eating the meat and the cheese and the highly processed food, chances are you have elevated levels of inflammation in your body. And while short-term inflammation is good for us, it helps us to fight infection, or it's due to injury, and, and it's good in that case, 
But the inflammation that lasts for months or years is not. And chronic inflammation has been linked to a lot of problems. The elevated blood cholesterol is also a risk factor for heart disease and strokes, two of the leading killers in the United States. And that saturated fat, which is primarily found in meat, poultry, cheese, and other animal project products, is a major driver of our blood cholesterol levels. So diets such as those that are high in dairy, eggs, and meat can foster the growth of disease-promoting bacteria as well. There was a study done that showed when omnivores eat choline or carnitine, which is found in meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, and dairy, our gut bacteria makes a substance that's converted by our liver to a toxic product called TMAO. It's an unpronounceable word, trimethylamine in oxide, and it's a molecule that's generated from that choline, that betaine, and that carnitine via our gut microbial metabolism. We're going to talk a little bit more about gut health in a little while, too. Another thing is that the animal protein, especially in the red and the processed meat, has been shown in study after study to increase the risk of type 2 diabetes as well. And the, in, the red meat intake, um, increasing red meat intake by more than just half a serving per day was associated with a 48% risk in diabetes. So... That's another thing to be concerned about. But the average omnivore in the US gets more than 1.5 times the optimal amount of protein, most of it from animal sources. So when you think about cutting out meat and you're worried about your protein, it's definitely not a problem. If you're eating meat, you're probably getting a lot more protein than you really need. And that excess protein does not make us stronger or leaner. The excess protein is stored as fat or it's turned into waste. And animal protein is a major cause of weight gain, heart disease, diabetes, inflammation, and cancer. And if your meals do include meat, just don't overindulge. Choose lean cuts. Avoid oversized portions. You should be eating a card deck size piece of meat, three ounces and no more, and not at every meal. And you want to make sure that you've got half your plate in veggies and that one quarter of your plate is that meat and one quarter of it is a whole grain. And that way you're getting a much more balanced, um, much healthier um, meal. I wanted to jump in really quickly. Yeah, go ahead, Laura. I've never had someone like describe bacon in such disgusting ways. Like everyone is like, oh my God, bacon. We love bacon. And I'm like thinking over here, oh my God, this is the easiest thing to like cut out because of all of the reasons you just mentioned. So kudos to that. (laughs) Good. Because it's a tough one to give up. I still say I love bacon. I mean, you know, it's just so good. But when you hear about what's really in it and what it's doing to you, it's like, how can you eat it again? I know. Um, And the other thing is to watch some of those documentaries, right? The Forks Over Knives and, you know, some of those that really show you um, the truth about our meat and where it's coming from. The other thing I'll say, still on the meat thing, I like to tell people that their meat should have a pedigree. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to eat that three ounce piece of meat a couple of times a week, make sure that it is grass fed and grass finished. No antibiotics, the cleanest, most high quality meat that you can afford to buy. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. So on to the refined grain. So eating the refined carbs or the simple carbs is linked to drastically increased risks of a lot of those diseases I've been mentioning. And almost every nutrition expert agrees that the refined carbs should be limited. Refined grains are grains that have had the fibrous and nutritious parts removed. And the biggest source is white flour made from refined wheat. So refined carbs have been stripped of all that fiber, the vitamins and the minerals. And so they're really now empty calories. They're also digested very quickly and that gives them a high glycemic index. That means that they they lead to rapid spikes in blood sugar and insulin levels after meals. So eating foods high on the glycemic index has been linked to overeating and increased risk of many diseases. 
And sadly, sugars and refined grains are a very large part of the total carbohydrate intake in many countries. The main dietary sources of refined carbs are the white flour, the white bread, the white rice, your pastries, sodas, snacks, pasta, sweets, breakfast cereals, and all of that added sugar. And wheat is just something to be cautious of. It's a highly sprayed and genetically modified crop. You're going to want to do wheat, organic, non-GMO, whole wheat, if you do any at all. And whole grains like barley, brown rice, quinoa, oatmeal, popcorn, those things are good. Not the microwave popcorn in the bag. Don't do that. Um, But those are the whole grains that are good for you. And now we have to talk about sugar. Eating too much added sugar can have many negative health effects. An excess of those sweetened foods and beverages can lead to the weight gain, the blood sugar problems, and that increased risk of diseases. And we know that sugar feeds cancer. We, I'm not saying it causes cancer. To date, there are no randomized controlled trials showing that sugar causes cancer. There is, however, an indirect link between sugar and cancer. Eating a lot of high sugar foods, such as the cakes and cookies and the sweetened beverages, can contribute to that excess calorie intake. And this may lead to the weight gain and the excess body fat. And research has shown that being overweight or obese increases the risk of 11 types of cancers. So definitely something to think about. Be sure you're looking on the ingredient list for those hidden sugars as well. Read the labels and find a different product if there's added sugar in something that doesn't really need it. Quite honestly, I taste zero difference between the pasta sauce with sugar and the pasta sauce without sugar. So buy the one without sugar. Same goes for salad dressings and, um, you know, lots of other products. There's sugar in it. And I look at labels sometimes and I'm like, why? Why is there sugar in here? It's because Americans have become addicted to sugar. And also remember, sugar is also known as high fructose corn syrup, malt syrup, date sugar, grape sugar, malto, maltose, sucrose, fructose, dextrose, cane juice, treacle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit scary. Get used to reading your labels and don't believe the marketing claims on the front of the label. Read the ingredient list. And if you really need a sweetener, use raw organic coconut palm sugar, real maple syrup, honey, or stevia. And I like to say if a recipe calls for a small amount of sugar, like a tablespoon or less, I just skip it all together. I just don't put it in there at all, because what difference is one tablespoon of sugar really gonna make? And it helps you break that sugar habit that you have. Same with salt, probably don't need to add the salt that's really being called for. All great advice right there. I remember when I was going in for CT scans, you know, they give you an IV and I was talking to the nurse who was, you know, sticking and probing. And she was like, we give you this solution because what it does is like a sugar, right? It goes exactly to where the cancer is and lights it up like fireworks under the CT scan. And that's when the light bulb went off. I was like, oh my God, sugar. Like, and to your point, like, I really appreciate you talking about the the evidence-based side is that there is no direct correlation yet to date. But what we know is that some of these other lifestyle habits, we can start to modify. And um, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, it really does. And we we do have a sugar addiction, most people, right? And so it's it's breaking that sugar habit and it can sound really hard. But you know what? Just start cutting it out where you can, where it's really obvious. And, and then if you're going to have a little treat every now and then, if you can do a treat without it being over over the top and leading you to just keep going, fine. Um, enjoy I it. Also, I remember also giving up sugar and trying to modify my diet and then going back to like tasting a pear or a peach and having it be so sweet that I was like, oh my God, this is, I mean, one, it's very satisfying, but two, your taste buds, I think, start to respond to other types of food when you're not covering it in all this like sugar coated other stuff. Yeah. The sugar, the salt and the fat that's added to our processed foods really just changes our taste buds. And in my house, I have two near, you know, college age sons and a husband. And and we talk about the difference in our, our 
taste buds, right? Like things taste different to me than they do to them. And they're not completely on board with my um, choices for food, but that's okay. I'm, I'm working on them and slowly, you know, working yeah. on, around that. Let's go on and talk about GMOs. So we wanna avoid products that are made with any of the crops that are genetically engineered. And most genetically engineered ingredients are products made from the big five, corn, soybeans, canola, beet sugar, and cottonseed. And those are used in processed foods. An estimated 92% of corn and 94% of the soy grown in the US are genetically modified. So despite the fact that there's very little research on the long-term effect that these scientifically engineered foods have on us. And I recommend that of those big five that you just always buy the non-GMO version of corn, soybeans, avoid canola, avoid beet sugar, etc. cetera. And um, those sweeteners, such as the fructose, the dextrose, and the glucose, those um, are often um, just modified food starches and, and they're, they're loaded up in, you know, the corn, the corn flour, the meal, the oil, the starch, the glu gluten, the syrup, all those sweeteners. It's, it's just a, a lot of stuff you just really don't need that doesn't have any nutritional value. And the sugar, beet sugar, it's not specified, if, if it's not specified as 100% cane sugar, it's likely from a genetically engineered sugar beet. And then your soy, I mentioned, is highly, highly genetically modified. Um, same with the canola oil, which is also known as rapeseed oil and the cottonseed oil. So those GMO crops were specifically developed to allow farmers to use more herbicides without killing the crops themselves. And this is problematic because continuous exposure to toxins, including pesticides, is one of the key environmental triggers for developing an autoimmune disease and maintaining a high toxic burden, which can cause your existing autoimmune condition to progress. And those GMOs disrupt your gut balance as well. So we've all heard of gly glyphosate, right? That's the herbicide that's used on the genetically modified crops. It's also a very potent chemical that can attack the bacteria in your gut. Unfortunately, the good bacteria in your gut, the kind that can help with digestion and keeping the bad bacteria in check, are more likely to be susceptible to glyphosate, while the bad bacteria, including strains that cause salmonella and botulism, are highly resistant to glyphosate. So this means that eating GMO foods can decrease your healthy bacteria and increase the bad bacteria, putting you at risk for candida overgrowth, leaky gut, and inflammation, which can contribute to autoimmune disease and cancer. And those GMO crops require huge amounts of chemicals that are harmful to our soil, water, the atmosphere, and the creatures. And increasing the need for stronger and more poisonous pesticides causing a growing epidemic of super weeds. So you've heard about the super bugs when it comes to antibiotics. Well, now we're creating super weeds when it comes to um, the pesticides. And this is contributing to the global warming problem. They're contaminating our organic and our local food systems. And even the beneficial insects can be harmed like the bees and the butterflies. So we should also be thinking about the state of our um, planet Earth as well. So look for packaging or produce stickers with USDA organic or non-GMO project seals. All organic foods must be non-GMO, but unless the product is labeled, not all non-GMO products are organic. I say always go non-GMO, and if you can't afford everything organic, that's okay. Check the ewg.org for the list of the um, dirty dozen and the clean 15 so that you know which foods are safe to buy non-organic and save yourself a little bit of money. All right. We have to talk about alcohol too. Sorry, folks. We want to avoid or limit alcohol consumption. And this is one of the things that I immediately gave up when I was diagnosed with metastatic cancer. And remember I was diagnosed in November did I ever feel like the biggest bump in a log that December? What a party pooper I was. 
but I got over it. I figured out how to still be fun and interesting without alcohol. Alcohol is made by adding yeast to crushed grains, fruits, veggies, and allowing that mixture to ferment. Frequent alcohol consumption has been shown to promote inflammation, and it may contribute to a number of health problems, right? It's also metabolized by our liver, and frequent in intake can lead to increased fat inside our liver cells. Obviously, we know about alcohol abuse, which leads to cirrhosis, which is a very serious condition. And while alcohol intoxication is only temporary, chronic alcohol abuse can impair brain function permanently. And alcohol abuse and depression are often linked. People may start abusing alcohol due to depression, or they may become depressed because they're abusing alcohol. It is simply addictive and highly toxic. And it's a risk factor for cancers of the mouth, throat, colon, breast, and liver. So if you're going to drink, be sure you're doing it in moderation. And moderate drinking is defined as one standard drink per day for women, two for men. And while heavy drinking is defined as more than three drinks per day for women and four for men, you gotta think about it this way. One drink is a 12 ounce beer, an eight ounce malt liquor, five ounces of wine, not filling your whole glass up, five ounces, and an ounce and a half shot of a hard liquor. Now, red wine may be one of the healthiest alcoholic beverages, probably due to its high concentration of antioxidants. The grape skins in red wine contain a polyphenol or a plant-based compound called resveratrol, which has been shown in laboratory studies to act as an antioxidant that can fight cancer. So it's theorized then that res resveratrol may cancel out the negative effects of light drinking and help prevent cancer. I myself with ERPR positive breast cancer choose not to drink red wine. It increased my hot flashes. So that wasn't any fun. And I just don't have a taste for alcohol anymore. And if I want a little something um, and putting it, sparkling water in a wine glass doesn't do it for me, then maybe I'll have just a little vodka and soda or sip a tequila because you're gonna sip it slower and um, those are things that you're not adding a bunch of sugary concoctions to go with, right? So when you have a margarita, guess what it's loaded with? Not only the alcohol, but all the sugar and all of that stuff that goes with the mixer. Sorry, don't mean to rain on your parades, but <laughs> think about it from your health perspective. All right, I am not gonna have enough time to cover everything, Laura, because we've had some great conversations. No, absolutely. <laughs> this has been such great information too. And I know, I feel like it's one of those things like you hit, what's the saying, like over the head with a hammer, like the alcohol piece too. I feel like even when you just Google breast cancer and alcohol, it comes up all the time. So I just really appreciate you reminding us what yeah. the serving size is, what like moderation right. actually means. Um, and it's hard too, because I know a lot of times and I'll throw myself out there. I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I'm like, well, I'm going to have a bottle of wine because I'm really upset and depressed and angry. And it leads to, I think some of those other side effects of the hot flashes don't even get me started, but the depression side, the anxiety and the, the self-esteem piece, right? You, you end up on this um, downward spiral. And so, you know, it's, I think it's one thing to be there in a moment, but know that it's a continuum and you don't have to stay there. Right, right. Yeah, and you can start to just kind of taper off a little bit and wean yourself. You don't have to go cold turkey. I did the cold turkey thing, um, and it was it was pretty it was pretty rough, but I I managed it. That's just how I am. Other people, you just know that making small changes over time is going to be very beneficial. So don't feel like if you can't give it all up at once that you shouldn't even try. Definitely try those small steps. Yeah. And I did, I did the wine the night of my diagnosis too. Oh yeah, sister-in-law's girlfriend showed up, bottle of wine, yeah. But if you're drinking wine every night after work because you had a stressful day or you're trying to work and school your, you school your kids and you know all this other stuff that's going on in your diagnosis, just don't let the glass of wine every night be your crutch. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about healthy changes and, and what is a healthy diet. And I mentioned Michael Pollan earlier. In his uh, research, he summarized it with that famous quote, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And in the studies he reviewed, the subjects derived the most benefit when they ate unprocessed foods in their wholest forms and when the majority of their diets were vegetables and when they maintained a low daily calorie intake. Now, I mentioned I was going to go back to the radical remission survivors. And what Dr. Turner found was those survivors did lots of different things when it came to their diets. So some of them were very specific and went vegan. Some of them went keto. Others went plant-based it was all very bio-individual. So there is no one diet that the Radical Remission books or the work of Dr. Turner really prescribes to anybody. But the overall sweeping trends that the Radical Remission survivors did where they greatly reduced or eliminated meat, wheat, meaning those refined grains, sweets, and dairy products. And they replaced those things with veggies and fruit with half of their plate being dedicated to veggies and fruit. And they also increased um, their filtered water intake. So clean, good water, so mm -hmm. drinking lots of water. And the important thing to note is that all of the diets mentioned, that vegan, you know, uh, plant-based and keto, included eating those whole organic vegetables while reducing the sugar and the grains and the processed foods. And when you make those kinds of dietary changes, research shows that it can reduce your inflammation and strengthen your immune system, which is then helping your body to be better capable of removing the cancer cells more effectively. And then we um, talk a little bit more about research with, with all of the radical remission factors and the scientific research on the plant-based diet backs up that plant-based lifestyle choice. So if you look at the collective body of research on the impact of diet on illness over a 15 year time span, a team of researchers from across the United States determined that a diet rich in veggies, fruits and plant based proteins like beans and whole grains significantly decreased the risk of illness, cardiovascular disease and cancer by 12 to 28 percent. And I said I was going to talk a little bit more about the microbiome or our gut health. And the state of our microbiome is really important. So the microbiome is those trillions of bacteria in your digestive tract. And that microbiome can predict whether or not you'll get colon cancer, for instance. So there was a study that showed certain short chain fatty acids suppress inflammation and cancer, whereas other microbial metabolites promote cancer growth. So gut health is of the utmost importance when importance when it comes to preventing cancer and our microbiome changes drastically depend on what we eat. And there was also a team of researchers at Tufts University that isolated diet alone as a cause of cancer. They found that a suboptimal diet accounted for 5% of the invasive cancers, while 4 to 6% of diagnoses were attributed to alcohol intake. Seven to eight percent of diagnosis were attributed to excessive body weight, and two to three percent were attributed to physical inactivity. And in that study, suboptimal meant eating too few veggies, fruits, and whole grains, and too much highly processed meat, red meat, and sugar sweetened beverages. And of these factors, the high intake of processed meat and the low intake of whole grains were the two factors associated with the largest number of new cancer diagnoses. All right, so what can you add? What can you do to make your diet better? Your cancer fighting foods. And if you've done any research or looked at anything that you can do to help your health from a diet perspective, you've seen this list. I took red wine off of it. Um, you can you can weigh that out. You think that resveratrol is going to help you over that? That's fine. That's your choice. But um, cruciferous veggies should be eaten once every day. So that's your cabbage, your kale, your broccoli, your Brussels, um, your arugula, or what the Europeans call rocket, is a cruciferous vegetable. Radishes are a cruciferous vegetable. So look up the list of cruciferous vegetables. And make sure when you go shopping that you have enough to eat one every single day, one helping of cruciferous veggies. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because I want to get to some of our other content. 
So the more fruits and veggies thing, right? So every meal, 50%. And do what you have to do to sneak them in there. Grate them up. Finely chop, chop them. Add a lot of extra stuff to your salads. Add things to your pasta sauces. Whatever it takes. Load up your smoothies with greens. Do everything to get more nutritious food in. And drink more water. You want that pure filtered water. And you know you need half your body weight in ounces every day. So calculate that out. Buy yourself a pitcher you can leave sitting on the counter or in the fridge and make sure that you drink it, you know, fill it up and, and empty it at least once or twice a day, whatever it is you need to get the um, half your body weight. Now let's talk about phytoestrogens and breast cancer. And Laura and I talked a little bit about this ahead of time. And I, I, um, I do like to share this information and it is controversial, but there are studies that show, of course, you'll always find on any topic study that's for and a study that's against, but phytoestrogens are plant-based compounds that mimic estrogen because their chemical structure is very similar to that of estrogen from the body. They have been found to be beneficial in combating symptoms and conditions caused by estrogen deficiency. So this may be of particular benefit to pre and postmenopausal women who are having their hot flashes. Phytoestrogens may also play a role in fighting cancer. However, it's still controversial and more research is absolutely needed to understand this. Unfortunately, they don't spend a lot of time and money on researching something that can't be patented. But there we are. There are studies that have revealed that high consumption of soy products is associated with low incidences of hormone dependent cancers, including breasts and prostates. Soybeans contain large amounts of, of isoflavones. Previously, it's been demonstrated that genistein, one of the predominant soy isoflavones, can inhibit several steps involved in carcinogenesis. So basically, it can inhibit the development of cancer. It is suggested that genistein possesses mechanisms of action, including inhibition and modulation of different signaling pathways associated with the growth of cancer cells. Moreover, genistein is also a potent inhibitor of angiogenesis. Uncontrolled angiogenesis is considered a key step in cancer growth, invasion, and metastasis. So I want to mention that um, I see Dr. Keith Block of the Block Center for Integrative Cancer Treatment in the Chicago area. And I've talked to Dr. Block many times about soy and breast cancer and phytoestrogens and breast cancer. Dr. Block has told me that processed soy foods, such as soy burgers, typically contain very low amounts of that genistein and other soy items such as miso and soy sauce contain even less. In fact, he says a whole bottle of soy sauce contains only about six or seven milligrams of isoflavones which would have no effect at all on breast cells, though it would be quite a lot of salt. So Dr. Block counsels that there's no need to pass on the tofu or the tempeh, so long as you're eating soy foods in moderation, just like anything else, and be sure your soy is non-GMO. Dr. Block also stated in, in a 2016 article that he wrote, um, he stated that in, sorry, I can send you guys the link later to Dr. Block's site for all these soy articles he's written, but he stated that in 2016, the studies suggested that eating moderate amounts of soy foods is safe for breast cancer survivors. In fact, in studies conducted by Dr. Anna H. Wu and others at the University of Southern California showed that women who consume approximately one to two servings of soy yeah. food each day not isolated soy supplements, you wanna avoid those, but if you eat soy food each day, you actually have a reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence or of being diagnosed with the disease. And moreover, these studies, uh, there were three studies in China and two in the US that provided further evidence that women who ate more soy had better survival after breast cancer diagnoses than those who ate the least soy. So 
I can again share these different studies. I, I've got the PubMed studies and, you know, links to those. If anybody wants those, I can bring, pull those all together. Oops, pull those all together in a document for everyone. Yeah, we can definitely send that out as a follow up to this webinar yeah. as well. So people have yeah. access to the resources. Yeah, since I'm really running out of time here. I know. Sorry. Um, Sorry. This information has been so helpful. Can I just ask and interject? Um, sure. like, can you share with us like what your daily diet, diet looks like? You yeah. Know, I think this is, like really great information to take. And I'm just trying to think like I'm now going to go downstairs and make a huge salad for dinner. Like I'm, I can't wait. Um, but you know, you wake up in the next morning and you're like, okay, great. I'm going to go for that sugary cereal or, you know, something, something that's less healthy. What's, can you share with us? Like, what's your, what does your daily menu look like? Yeah. Let me tell you what I ate today and actually what I eat every day for breakfast, because I'm just really addicted to it. I take, um, organic, um, oatmeal and, um, I eat it cold. So I don't cook my oatmeal. But I make it up ahead of time. So I've got containers and I make it up for my week. And the, it's oatmeal, raisins, walnuts, flaxseed, um, cinnamon, and a scoop of my, my protein mix. So I use a, um, a protein mix that um, it's not a plant-based protein. It does have whey protein. But again, conversations with Dr. Block, I know that this is safe for me and this is okay. Mm -hmm. um, so then I put my almond milk on it in the morning when I'm ready to eat it. And I eat it like a cold cereal. I slice up a banana or maybe put some blueberries on it. I try to have berries with every meal or every breakfast. So whether it's blueberries, strawberries, whatever I can find that's in season or, you know, a little, a small smoothie to go with it um, with every, you know, frozen stuff blended up in there. Um, let's see for lunch today, I had barbecue jackfruit. So I don't know if anybody's familiar with jackfruit, but you can now get jackfruit in, it's a big ugly vegetable, um, that is a mess to cut into. And, and I did it once and I'll never do it again. So go to Trader Joe's and get the cans of jackfruit and you can take that jackfruit and flavor it with barbecue sauce that does not have added sugar. And so I made a barbecue spice and these, these, none of these recipes are my own. Everything I eat, I am finding on all kinds of great resources. Um, and um, so I had the barbecue jackfruit today, which was left over from dinner I'd made the other night. And I did buy a, um, a little package of uh, gluten-free dinner rolls to use as my buns. So like I was having a little barbecue beef sandwich, right? But it was barbecue jackfruit sandwich. And along with that, I had some leftover purple sweet potatoes that I ate. And then for dinner tonight, I had this giant salad. My husband even looked at it. He's like, oh, my God, that thing's huge. So it's um, red leaf lettuce because that's the best lettuce for you. The healthiest, most nutritious lettuce is the red leaf lettuce with arugula mixed in. Or you can buy the spring mixed lettuce. That's really good, too, if you want to buy it already packaged and, and ready to use. And then I just loaded it up with vegetables. I had radishes, tomatoes. I usually cut all these vegetables ahead of time, so it's really easy for me to grab and just put it together. So I'll keep the radishes, tomatoes, cucumbers, sweet peppers, you know, whatever I've got cut up in a separate container from my lettuce, and then I just mix the two together. Put some black beans on top of it, and I put some um, um, seeds. I put... Um, sunflower seeds on it. Oh, and wow. I, I did not have my own salad dressing tonight, but I usually keep a couple of um, salad dressings on hand that have no sugar and, and are vegan products. And that was my dinner wow. tonight, along with some hummus and some gluten-free cracker master crackers, which I'm kind of addicted to. Amazing. Yeah. Well you're making me salivate. I'm like, so ready. I know, right. It's dinner time too. <laughs> um, and thanks for introducing us to some new foods as well, such as jackfruit. I'm going to go Google that and look for that um, in the grocery store for my yeah. Amazon prime order since we're in COVID and not really leaving the house these days. Um, Kyla, I want to let, I know you have um, to run also, we are approaching our one hour, which is amazing how much we could just talk about food and nutrition. But I want to leave our listeners and viewers with how do you get a hold of you and find you after this amazing presentation. And like I said earlier, too, for anyone who is subscribed to our newsletter, we can always do a follow up as well. And I can share your contact information with them so they can connect and get more information 
directly through you and your coaching and your expertise. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So here, this slide shows my email address. It's pretty simple. It's Carla at kmgcoach.com. So it's Carla with a K. And if you want to send me an email and ask me for my plant-based eating tips, I'll send it to you. And I'm sorry I didn't get through my whole presentation to give you a little more practice. No, I think it's like, we'll consider this part one. Um, there you go. <laughs> it's a lot of information for us to digest and even just kind of taking down, like, I was taking notes over here too, like, you know, what the gut health is and microbiome and, you know, it's, it's new vocabulary as if breast cancer isn't, you know, giving us enough new vocabulary to learn, understanding our, our cells and our proteins and enzymes and how they all work together to allow us to thrive. Carla, this yeah. has been amazing. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us and educating us. And I will definitely follow up with you for part two or invite you to write on our blog as well and continue to share your expertise with our community. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it very much. Take care, everyone. Bye.